Hi everybody, and welcome back to POCUS Cases. In this month's screencast, we are going to talk about pericardial effusions. Let's start off with a case. This is a 60-year-old female who suffers from malignant cancer who comes to the emergency department with increasing shortness of breath on exertion. Today, she felt pre syncopal while going up the stairs and called 911. Her vitals show the following. She is tachycardic with a heart rate of 120, and she is hypoxic with an oxygen saturation of only 88% and a respirate of 28. Also notice that she's hypotensive with a blood pressure of 70 over 30. She is afebrile. Let's take a look at what the literature says about pericardial effusions. In this study in the Annals of Emergency Medicine, 515 patients who were considered high risk for having a pericardial effusion were ultrasounded by the emergency physician. On review, 103 of the high risk patients actually had a pericardial effusion. ER physicians had a 96% sensitivity and 98% specificity with an accuracy of 97.5% at detecting the pericardial effusion. A more recent study showed that POCUS improves time to pericardial synthesis in the emergency department. So that is why pericardial effusion POCUS is one of my very few game changers of all the POCUS scans that are performed in the emergency department. And it is definitely on my list of the top 10 scans every emergency physician should know how to do. The neat thing about pericardial effusion POCUS is there are two ways to look for a pericardial effusion one easy and one more advanced. The sub xiphoid view is simple to perform, reproducible, and reliable. For this scan, it is common to use the curvilinear probe, but really any of the low frequency probes would work for this scan. For the personal long axis view, it is more challenging to obtain and requires some troubleshooting knowledge, such as when to roll the patient, which I would advise all novices do at the very start of every scan to maximize the chance of obtaining an adequate image on this view. Also, people with heart disease or medical conditions can have hearts that are different sizes and in slightly different positions in the chest. Thus, knowledge of when to slide, rotate, or sweep is also required when anatomical variations exist. For the sub xiphoid view, the curvy linear probe is most commonly used. For the personal long axis view, the cardiac probe, also known as the phased array probe, is most commonly used. To perform the sub xiphoid view, one must be cautious of where to start the scan. The heart, as everyone knows, is in the chest, but starting by placing the probe in the sub xiphoid area may not actually generate the best image of the heart. That's because of the stomach. The gastric air bubble in the stomach will obstruct your view. Thus, it's advised to start the scan by placing the gel in the lower part of the abdomen. This will allow the liver to act as a window so that you can see the heart through the abdomen. Ensuring that the liver is in the near field of the screen by starting lower in the abdomen will optimize your chances of having an adequate cardiac view. If you need an analogy to remember this, remember that we ask pregnant women to have a full bladder prior to doing a first trimester abdominal scan. This allows the bladder to be a window to the uterus, just like the liver is a window to the heart in the sub xiphoid view. As you push the gel towards the sub xiphoid area, the heart should come into view. Let's take a closer look at this anatomy. This area here in the near field is the liver. That is what's allowing you to see the heart through the abdomen. This chamber here is the right ventricle. This chamber here is the left ventricle. This chamber here is the left atrium. The area between the left atrium and the left ventricle is your mitral valve. This area here between the right ventricle and the left ventricle is the septum. The area that goes around the heart is your pericardium. And this black area here where there's no pericardium, that's where the great vessels come out. One of the key things I tell my residents to look for when determining if there's a pericardial effusion is finding the entirety of the seven. If they can see the entire seven, they have an adequate view. 
If any of the seven is obscured by bowel gas or the gastric air bubble, then they can miss a pericardial effusion. The top of the seven is where even the smallest pericardial effusion will hide. The top of the seven is where you want to be looking during the sweep. Here is a sweep of a normal heart where there is no pericardial effusion. Notice that no black appears on the top of the seven. In this still image, you can see the number seven. This is the RV, this is the LV, this is the septum. Notice here that this is the liver. The area between the liver and the free wall of the right ventricle has black between it. Notice that it's accumulating on the top part of the seven. In fact, you can see that the pericardial effusion goes almost all the way around the heart. Now let's watch a video of that previous image. Here is the seven, and here's the pericardial effusion that's accumulating on top of the seven. Now, I know what some of you might be saying. Wow, that looks like a big pericardial effusion. Well, let's talk about how to measure it. As you can see in the picture, it is performed by measuring from the far field portion of the liver to the near field portion of the heart, particularly the free wall of the right ventricle. If the distance between those areas is less than 0.5 centimeters, that roughly corresponds to 100 cc's. If the area is between 0.5 and 2 centimeters, that roughly corresponds to 100 to 500 cc's. A large effusion is when there's greater than 2 centimeters, which roughly corresponds to greater than 500 cc's. Just keep in mind that these are all ballpark measurements. A more interesting question would be, is there cardiac tamponade? Well, that should always remain a clinical finding. Do you remember Beck's triad of hypotension, distended JVD, and muffled heart sounds? Well, there's other findings on POCUS of cardiac tamponade, and the earliest findings of POCUS is right ventricular diastolic collapse. However, I want you to be aware that if your patient doesn't look unwell, or your patient is not hypotensive, then they are unlikely to be in tamponade. Also remember, the size of the effusion is less important in tamponade compared to the rate of accumulation. For example, if a cancer patient is making one extra milliliter of pericardial fluid every day, it would take months for them to become symptomatic as they probably will start to compensate for the extra fluid despite having a large effusion. On the other hand, if someone has penetrating trauma and develops a pericardial effusion, 100 milliliters over a few minutes to an hour can make them very, very unstable, and that relatively small effusion can be immediately life-threatening. A word of caution with the subxiphoid view. You need to be aware of epicardial fat. Here is a picture of the heart. Notice that the anterior portion of the heart has some yellow on it. This is epicardial fat, and it is normal to find in patients. All of us should have some amount of epicardial fat. The epicardial fat is found on the anterior portion of the heart. Now this is a Valentine's Day reconfiguration of the heart with the fat anterior. Now when an unstable patient comes into the ER, they are usually lying on their backs on a stretcher. When a subxiphoid pocus is performed, the fat is seen anteriorly, but would not be seen when the user sweeps posteriorly. The good news is that when patients have a pericardial effusion, the fluid would fall to the dependent area of the body, which would be posteriorly when a patient's lying on a stretcher. Thus, if you sweep anteriorly, and see black, but it disappears when you sweep posteriorly, it is likely epicardial fat. But when you sweep posteriorly, if you are still seeing black, then you are seeing a pericardial effusion. Now let's take a look at the peristernal long view. This view is started by placing the probe just to the left of the sternum 
around the third intercostal space with the marker aiming at the right shoulder. This is the image that you are trying to generate. Let's look at the anatomy. This chamber here is the right ventricle. This chamber here is the left ventricle. And this chamber here is the left atrium. The area between the left atrium and the left ventricle, these white little flaps here, that's the mitral valve. This area here on the outflow tract of the left ventricle, this is the closed aortic valve. Down here at the far field of the screen is the descending aorta. This area here between the right and the left ventricle is the septum. This white area here in the far field between the aorta and the heart is the pericardium. The important area to identify is the area between the descending aorta and the heart. This would be where the pericardium is. If this area is separated by a black area, then you have a pericardial effusion. Here is what a pericardial effusion looks like on a peristernal long view. Here is the left atrium. Here is the left ventricle. Here's the mitral valve. Here's the wall of the heart. Here's the aorta. And between the heart and the aorta, you see this black area here. This represents a pericardial effusion. When I play the video, you can clearly see that the black tracks between the aorta and the heart. A word of caution in the peristernal long view. Commonly, pleural effusions are mistaken as a pericardial effusion. Here are two side-by-side -side images. Here, in the left image, is where a pleural effusion will accumulate. Here, in the right image, is where a pericardial effusion will accumulate. The key feature that distinguishes a pericardial effusion from a pleural effusion in a peristernal long view is that a pericardial effusion will accumulate between the descending aorta and the heart. However, a pleural effusion will be lateral to where the aorta is on the screen and will not accumulate between the aorta and the heart. Let's take a look at on it on some patients. Here is an example of a pleural effusion. It does not accumulate between the heart and the aorta. Here is an example of a pericardial effusion. Here's the aorta, here's the heart wall, and we see the black between the two. Let's go back to our case. This was that 60-year-old female who came in short of breath on exertion, and here are her vital signs showing that she was tachycardic, hypoxic, and hypotensive. When we did a pocus of her heart, we see that her heart is surrounded by black fluid. Also notice that with each beat of her heart, her heart seems to be swinging within the pericardial fluid. If you look here in the near field, with each beat of the heart, the heart swings towards the near field and then swings away from the near field. Since each beat swings the heart in a different direction, do you know what ECG finding that you would see based on this pocus? If you said electrical alternands, you would be correct. When the heart swings closer to the near field, the electricity of the heart has a less distance to go to the ECG lead, and thus you get a taller R wave. However, when the heart swings further away and there's more fluid anteriorly to the heart, the electricity has to travel further distances to the ECG lead, and you're left with a shorter R wave. With each beat, if the heart swings back and forth, it'll go tall R wave, short R wave, tall R wave, short R wave, and that will give you the pathognomonic feature of electrical alternands, indicating that the patient has not only a pericardial effusion, but they're in tamponade. In this case, the patient had an emergency pericardiocentesis performed and 600 milliliters of pericardial fluid was taken off the heart. The patient's symptoms resolved and the patient's vitals normalized. So in summary, a subxiphoid view is easiest and best view for pericardial effusions. Just be careful to watch out for the anterior epicardial fat pad. Ensure that when you're sweeping the heart, that that black area that you see anteriorly disappears. If you're sweeping posteriorly and the black does not disappear, then you're dealing with a pericardial effusion.
A personal long view can be used if the sub-xiphoid view cannot be obtained. However, watch out for pleural effusions. Ensure that if you're seeing black in the far field, it's accumulating between the aorta and the heart. If it's not accumulating in that area, it's unlikely to be in the pericardium and most likely represents a pleural effusion. Finally, tamponade is a clinical finding and warrants an emergent pericardiocentesis. And as always, if there are any questions or comments, I would love to hear from you. Email me at pocuscases at gmail.com.